Thank you, Brad Paul. Yeah. Okay, today, um, like Brad Paul has already introduced, our topic for today is uh, the person of Christ. Um, the last uh, three classes, I, I'm right, three classes, we started with um, introduction to the Bible. So as we all know, this is a, a, for a foundation course. It is a, something that every believer has to be grounded in the knowledge, growing in order to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to know what we really believe as Christians. We need to understand why do we believe the Bible? Who is God? What is um, the basis or the the, the basis of my faith, of my believing. And this is a very, very good cause, you know, that every believer, if we're not grounded in this, it will really be very easy to be swept off our feet. Very easy to be confused with all the false doctrines that are flying around. Very easy to just be at the surface without really knowing what you believe or whom you believe. And then just be floating there and every doctrine, everything that is preached is like, like we're saying, is all about me, prosperity, and all those things. Because we don't have, a, we didn't have a, a, a foundation knowledge of what we believe. And with that kind of surface teaching, we cannot grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is what you know, we're supposed to be doing otherwise, once we get born again, we should be taken out of this world, but we have to grow, we have to mature, we have to be useful to the one that has called us. So this is a very good one. So we started with um, the, knowledge, um, the Bible and Rapport did a very, very, very wonderful work there. And then we moved on to what, how to know the Bible how to know the Bible. So this course is all about scriptures. We don't preach uh, self, not stories, but everything is, you know, founded on the scripture. So we have a lot of scriptures to cover. So having known that the Bible is the authority, the Bible is the word of God. So whatever we are studying has to come from the word of God. It has to be, you know, um, rooted deeply in the word of God. And then last week, Baba took us uh, through the, the person of Christ. I mean, uh, God, God, his um, attributes, the attributes of God. So last week, no, was it, it was yesterday, sorry, not last week. It was yesterday. So most uh, people will not have problem with um, knowing God as uh, we studied like, uh, yesterday. God is sovereign, we all agree. God is um, eternal, God is uh, uh, immutable, unchangeable, he's perfect, he's omniscient, he's omnipotent, yes. But today we're moving on to the person of Jesus Christ. The person of Jesus Christ, we know about the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So who is Jesus? The person of Jesus Christ. So. That is the topic for today. Let's pray before we start. Our Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We appreciate your love for us. We thank you for your mercies and your grace upon us. And we thank you for this very hour that you have brought us together again at your feet to study. Father, we pray that your grace will help us through in the name of Jesus. We pray for understanding that the eyes of our hearts be opened, that we will receive the word, that we will receive the grace to understand the word that you have uh, prepared for us today and that your word will prosper in us. Your word will be as a seed that falls on fertile ground. Help us to cultivate it in our hearts, O oh Lord, and that your word, O oh Lord, will produce the fruits of faith, righteousness, and all that you have prepared to do in our lives today in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray that as you have told us that your, the scriptures is given, 
for edification. Father, we pray that your word will edify us today. Your word will correct us where we need corrections. Your word will help us to know Jesus and who he really is. Your word will help us and instruct us <clears throat> in the righteousness of Christ and get us going in the way of maturity. In Jesus' name we pray. Holy Spirit, we ask that you come and take us through, not my word, but your word be spoken this hour in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So, yeah, continuing. Um, greetings all, uh, once again. Moving forward, when yesterday, Bra Paul mentioned the, the Bible being the Jesus book. We cannot overflow, we can't overemphasize this truth. You know, before some people will argue that uh, which book is more relevant? Is it the Old Testament? Is it the New Testament? That uh, probably we don't need the Old Testament anymore. And uh, uh, Baba helped us explain that yesterday. You know, the Bible is God's word. We have come to know that. And the Bible, Jesus, both the Old and the New Testament is all about Jesus. It's a Jesus book. We will call it that because he was there from the beginning and up to the book of Revelation. So it's all about Jesus. We cannot take him out. Um, we have learned that the Old Testament is Jesus concealed. Jesus was there all through the Old Testament from the beginning. Before the beginning, he was there. So he was concealed. They didn't know him. The prophets prophesied about him, but they, were, they didn't see him. He was concealed in the Old Testament. You know, some of them looked forward to that promise. You know, they looked forward, but they didn't see, except, you know, one or two, like Anna that saw him uh, after he was born. So the Old Testament has Jesus in it concealed, while the New Testament has Jesus revealed. So this is why we say that in a way the Bible is the Jesus book because it points to Jesus. But Paul also pointed out, you know, the I uh, in the book um, uh, Philip preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, starting from the book of Isaiah that the man was reading but didn't understand, he pointed him to Christ. So every scripture Every book of the Bible points to Christ. So that is why we say that the Bible is the Jesus book. The Old Testament was a preparation for the coming Messiah. So everything written in the Old Testament, the revelations, the account, the historical accounts and everything was God preparing for the coming of Jesus. His chosen of Israel, uh, the tribe of Israel, from there, Abraham and all the descendants, everything that happened, the exodus, the, the, the movement from Egypt to the prom, everything was preparing for the coming of Jesus. So it's all about Jesus. Then we move to the gospels. The gospel presents Christ, the presentation of Christ from Matthew, the birth of Christ, how he grew up, how he was a carpenter's son, how uh, uh, John, you know, uh, proclaimed him, you know, Christ was presented in the gospels. So it's still all about Christ. In the book of Acts, that was the proclamation of Christ. Christ was preached, missionary journeys, the apostles went preaching, the gospel spread across the, the, the from, from, Jerusalem to Samaria to the Gentile world, the gospel spread. So the act was the proclamation of Christ, while the epistles was the personification of Christ. You know, Christ being uh, brought, you know, to, to those that believe how to live in Christ, how to grow in Christ, Christ being personified as my savior. So that is for the book of Acts, Epistles, uh, I mean, for the 
book of epistles, as you see in Philippians 1, 2. Philippians 1, uh, to know, Philippians 1, 21, say for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's, it's about Christ in me, Christ being formed in me, you know, so that is uh, all about Christ. We're just trying to establish that the Bible is about Christ from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And then the book of Revelation tells us about the reign of Christ, the king that is coming to reign, the king that is coming to, you know, to rule over all. So he's coming in victory. He's, he will be coming in his glory. So the Bible is the Jesus book. There is no uh, two ways about it, except for those who do not understand. They will tell you the Old Testament is, uh, is not about Christ. The New Testament is about Christ. It's not true. It's all about Christ. In the beginning, Genesis 1, 1, is that in the beginning was the uh, uh, God created all things. He was God, the three, uh, three God in one, the Trinity, Christ was there. So Christ was there concealed. And then in the book of Revelation, Christ revealed in uh, his reign, his coming back again to reign. So also um, we see even in human history, we see that Christ is a central figure of all human history. Christ is, has been, you know, <laughs> the central figure, both from a historical a accounts and everything, you see Christ is there. So many describe him in different ways because they saw him, he was human, he lived in physical body, he lived. So some people said he was a prophet, some people said he was a, a great teacher, some people said he was just a good man, you know. But they acknowledge from history that Christ existed. And he has ever since been a central figure uh, of all human history. They didn't have problem about him you know, being a, a man or claiming to be a man. He was a man. Everybody saw him. So there was no problem about that. But the problem is saying that Jesus uh, Christ is God. Jesus Christ is God. So that is, it was something that it takes the revelation of God for people to, you know, come to that. And it's only God that gives that faith. And this is why it's very important to know who we are serving. As believers, we have to know. It is very important to know who Jesus is. Because if you don't know who Jesus is, you cannot defend your faith. When you meet a Muslim and they will tell you that uh, Jesus was just one of the prophets, you will not be able to defend it because you don't know who Jesus is. So you cannot be a believer and not know who Jesus is. And that is why today's topic is very important. We, we need to know who we truly will believe. We need to know who Jesus is. So most of us before would think that Jesus was just um, a, a name that we call when we're facing an attack, just say Jesus and the, the demons will just run away. So Jesus, to, to some, maybe like uh, some uh, uh, professing believers, maybe like just a magic wand, just call Jesus and everything, just say the name of Jesus and everything, you know, will fall in place. So who is this Jesus? We really need to know who this Jesus is. To know God and uh, Christ, who is Christ? Let's uh, look at um, John uh, chapter three. Let's look at John 17, three. Please, if you find it, you can help us read John 17, three. John 17, 3. Yeah. And, this, and this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. Thank you. Thank you very much. So to know Christ is very important. So we cannot be Christians and not know Christ because he is eternal life. To know God and to know Christ is eternal life. 
I want us to look at uh, Matthew 16, verse 13. Matthew 16, 13, he said, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man, who do people say that the son of man is? So he asked them, who do people say? Of course, many people were saying different things. Many people were saying maybe he's just one of the prophets. Some say he was a liar. Some said he was a, 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 a teacher, something. People have, the, because God made man to know that, you know, there's a vacuum. Everybody wants to know that there's God and see God. But not everybody know. Man cannot discover God except God reveals himself. So who do people say that the son of man is? This is a question that we are treating today and it's very important and we have to, you know, we'll answer it by the time we finish the lesson. And verse 15 of that uh, Matthew 16 also says, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? But who do you say? So as a believer, who do you say that Jesus, it doesn't matter what others say that he is because they don't know him. If they don't know the father, they cannot know the son. Even the Pharisees did not know him because they did not truly know the father. If they knew the father, they would know the son. They didn't know the son because they didn't know the father. So, but now the question is to us, who do you say that I am? He asked, he said to uh, Simon Peter and Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, 17. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. So you see the revelation of Christ is eternal life. And it's only that those whom God has revealed to that know Christ. Others may know Christ in the flesh, but they didn't know the Messiah. Many people in his days, they, they touched him, they saw him, they passed him and all the, but they didn't know him because they didn't know the father. So who do you say that Christ is? Who is Jesus to you? And he will answer as we go forward. So the, let's look at them, um, Matthew 27, 20, 22. Matthew 27, 22. Please read for us if you find it. Matthew 27, 22, it says, sorry. Pilate responded, then what should I do with this Jesus who is called the Messiah? You know, that was when they took him to Pilate. After he, you know, um, interrogated him, he, he now asked, I think like a rhetorical question, he asked himself, then what shall I do with this Jesus? So this is the question that will come to at the end of this uh, study. By the time we go through who Jesus is, by the time we finish looking at the scriptures that reveal who Christ is, at the end, we all have to answer this question. Then what shall I do with this Jesus who is called the Messiah? That will be at the end, we'll come back to it. So we'll see that Christ is everything as the scriptures will reveal to us when we move on see that christ is everything you know he is life he is a everything his wisdom his hope his perfection so to to a believer who knows christ to someone who has come to know christ you will know that there is nothing like christ plus jesus plus some people have a they go to church and they still have a, some charms to help them you know, that, okay, we have Jesus there, but there's something more. Some look for deeper things, deeper feelings, deeper experiences, you know, to really validate that, you know, that they have a life or they have a power or something. They want deeper experience. Deep, there's nothing deeper than Christ. There is no experience that is deeper than Christ. There is no knowledge outside of Christ. There is no Christ plus. Christ is everything. He is life. He is the only hope. There is no other hope outside of Christ. He is all wisdom, the wisdom of God. He is all knowledge, perfect. 
and we will see all this as we move forward. He is perfect. There is nothing that anybody could desire that can compare with Christ. And this is why uh, uh, Paul in Philippians 3, 7 says, uh, I count all things as lost for the sake of Christ. I count all things as lost for the sake of Christ. This is what the true knowledge of Christ brings to the life of a believer. When we get to know who Christ is, we can say like Paul, I count all things as lost. Nothing, nothing in this life will mean anything for a believer that knows who Christ is. But for, for, for a believer that doesn't really know who Christ is and sees, has a, a wrong concept of Christ, you are just not, it's, it's difficult for such person to be able to stand and say, like Paul, I count all things as, as loss. And that is why people want to use Christ as a means to get what they want, because it's not allowed. For them, it's about Christ. For them, it is about me, me. What will I get? How will I prosper? How will I make money? How will my business prosper? How will I get children? How will I do this? So to them is a means, Christ is a means to an end, to what they want to achieve. But for somebody that truly knows Christ and who he is, you'll be able to say like Paul, I count all things as loss for the sake of Christ. And that is my prayer that as God continues to lead us to grow in the, in the grace of the knowledge of Christ, that we will all get to the point where we'll say, Truly, I count all things as loss for the sake of Christ, where Christ will mean everything to us. Christ will mean more than money. We don't mind to lose everything, but have Christ. So this is my prayer that God would take us into that level of knowledge of Christ that will help us be able to proclaim like Paul, that we count all things as loss. Praise God. So uh, moving on now, who is Jesus? Let's look at the um, second Thessalonians uh, 1, 1, 1. Who is Jesus? This is the, he's referred to as Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. Let's see second Thessalonians 1, 1. From Paul, Silas and Timothy to the church in Thessalonica in, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you from God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord Jesus Christ, that is his title. In most places in the scripture is referred to that, Lord, sorry, Lord Jesus Christ. So let's see who Jesus is with regard to his title, Lord Jesus Christ. With regard to his title, who is he? Who is Lord? Lord is somebody that we are subject to. Maybe somebody can help us. Who is Lord? Why, when you call somebody Lord, what does it really mean to you? Let's make it a little bit interactive. So, yes, praise yeah. the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah, when you call somebody Lord, it means uh, you reverence the person with so much honor and you look at that person that is highly superior. Just like uh, we go to an oba or a leader or a president, yeah. Yeah. We, want to, we want to rate them so high. So somebody we rate higher than every other. I think that's the, the connotation of the, the use Lord. as Lord. Yes, yeah. Lord. So somebody that you willingly submit to, you regard the person, you're subject to the person, and you really, you explain it very well. Let's see 1 Corinthians 7, 23. 23, 1 Corinthians 7, 23. It says, um, God paid a high price for you, so don't be enslaved by the world. Am I reading the right place? Yeah. Okay, let's see um, 1 Peter 1, 18. Okay. 
For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. So we were bought and we be, he, like, um, let's use the analogy of a master, a slave and a, a master. The master buys the slave and the slave becomes subject to his master and becomes like a slave to the master because the master paid for you. So the same way Christ paid for us, and that's why we know him as Lord, because he purchased us from, from darkness. He purchased us from uh, eternal death. So he is our Lord. So we are subject to him. We accept him as our Lord. We submit to him as our Lord. We're looking at Jesus' title. What does the title say about him? Because we want to know who this Jesus is. What does his title say about him? Remember, one, he is Lord in that he bought us and then we are his. He paid for us. So we are subject to him. He is our Lord. We, we surrender to him. He's also Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is a Greek word, meaning a, a, like a Joshua. But for, I think the Bible translators, you know, to differentiate it from the Joshua, they make Jesus. But the, it's the same word as Joshua. And the meaning of it is savior. We find this in Matthew 1, 21. She will give back, Matthew 1, 21, she will give back to a son and you will name him Jesus <clears throat> because he will save his people from their sins. So this is the meaning of the name, save, the one that will save his people from their sins. So he's savior. So Christ, what is the meaning of Christ? We see John 1, 41. Christ means, I mean, uh, means anointed one, the anointed one, the Messiah. So from the title of his name, we see that he is Lord, he is the Savior, and he is the anointed one, the Messiah, from the title. Still on, who is Jesus? So for some, uh, this is uh, from, his, uh, from his title. But what does Jesus say? What did Jesus say about himself? His testimony, you remember he came to reveal God to us. What did he say about himself? So we'll find this in the many phrases that Jesus said in the scriptures about who he is, the I am, that is who he is. So we're going to look at each of those, uh, each of them, and then we're, sorry. Okay. Who Jesus said he is. John 5.36. Let's look at John 5.36. If you're there, you read. I, I can read from here. But I have a proof about myself that is greater than that of John. The things I do, which are the things my father gave me to do, prove that the father sent me. So he is giving a, a testimony of himself. I have a proof about myself. Remember John the Baptist, was uh, testifying about him, the Messiah that you know was coming. But Jesus also testified about himself. He said, but I have a proof about myself that is greater than what John, uh, than that of John, greater than uh, uh, John. He said, the things I do, which are the things my father gave me to do, prove that the father sent me. And verse 39 says, you carefully study the scriptures because you think they give eternal life. They do, in fact, tell about me. So the whole of scriptures, like we said before, pointed to Jesus. Tells about the, the, there was no there is no mention of the name Jesus in the Old Testament, which generally referred to as the scriptures. But Jesus said the scriptures tell about me. So we have uh, established that point that the scriptures point to Jesus from Genesis unto Malachi points to Jesus. So. Who does he say? What is his testimony about himself? What is the testimony of Jesus about himself? I will read out the, um, the I am's of Jesus, the I am's of Christ. I am, I am of Christ. 
Uh, first, it says, I am gentle and humble in heart. We find this in Matthew 29. Mat Matthew 11, 29, sorry. Matthew 11, 29 said, I am gentle and humble in heart. And uh, as we move forward, we'll see how this humility was expressed, how he expressed it when he became a man. Again, he said, I am the son of God. We see that in Matthew 28, 20. Matthew 28, 20. He is the son of God, the only begotten son of God. So the, uh, God has many sons, like you and I were children of God. So why is Christ the only the son of God or the only begotten son of God? Because he was begotten. He is the begotten son. While we are adopted sons, we became, we became sons of God through Christ. He, he adopted us to God. So Christ is the only begotten son of God. Matthew 27, 43. You can take the scriptures. We may not be able to read all the scriptures. So just take them down. Say, I am always, I am with you always. We saw in the... In our study yesterday, that God is omnipresent. So Christ is also omnipresent. So this also establishes the fact that He is God. Christ, Jesus Christ is God. Say, I am with you always. In Matthew 28, 20, when he was uh, addressing the disciples before he you know, ascended to heaven, he said, I am with you always. I am the bread of life. John 6:35. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life for us. We know that a uh, man cannot survive without food. So Jesus Christ is to the spirit what a uh, natural food is to the body. If you don't eat, you get weak, you get, you get tired, you get weak, and eventually you die. So Jesus is the bread of life, and he gives life, spiritual life to the soul of man. So. Um, Say, I am the light of the world, John 8, 12. So his light, light gives life. Why darkness is death. So Jesus is the light of the world. The one that brought life to the dead people like us. So he is the light of the world. He said, I am, I am not of this world. That is John 8, 23, because he came from the father. I am the door, John 10, verse 9. I am the door. So faith in Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, is the only true way of being saved. There is no other way of being saved. So we have to know this Jesus, that he is the only true way to be saved. Some people will claim that uh, people can also be saved in different other ways. Uh, Muslim, uh, Muslims will claim that... Uh, uh, okay, some will say it's not only through Jesus, there are other ways to, are you saying other religion? Because that's the world now. But as a believer who knows Jesus, we should know that Jesus says, I am the door. So he is the only, only true way of being saved. He says, I am the good shepherd. John 10, 14. He's the good shepherd, the one that laid down his life for his sheep. This is the Jesus we're talking about. So he is the good shepherd. So everything he claimed to be, he demonstrated it. So he's a good shepherd that, lay, that died to save his flock and, you know, his reason. Say, I am the resurrection and the life. John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. So there is no life without Jesus. He is the resurrection, the only one that can give life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, verse 6. John 14, verse, verse 6. He's the way, the only way, like we said before, the only way that we can be reconciled back to God, our Father. And he is the truth because he is the truth of God. Remember, Jesus is the word of God. So he is the truth of God. He is the only true revelation of God. He is the truth and the life. So he is the life of God. So this is in John 14, verse 6. Next is say, I am the vine. John 15, verse 5. Jesus said, I am the vine. We know that 
vine produces sap that gives life to the branches. So if there's a, 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 no branch can succeed without being attached to the, to the vine. So Jesus is the vine that gives life and makes us alive and fruitful. He says, I am a king, John 18, 37. Jesus is the king, the king of glory. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the Almighty. You see this in Revelation 1, 8, and also Revelation 21, verse 6. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Think of um, Alpha is the first letter of Greek alphabet, and Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. So it's like saying I am the A and the Z, the English alphabet. So Every language has an alphabet. So the English uh, language has 26 alphabet. The Greek, I'm just trying to explain, you know, this meaning of alpha and omega. You know, just imagine that uh, with 26 letters of the English alphabet, you can write infinite, like you can fill libraries with books, knowledge, as limited as the human understanding is as limited as the human mind is in terms of knowledge. With, the, with just 26 letters of the English alphabet, you can fill all the libraries in the world. So Jesus is the supreme and sovereign alphabet. In him is all wisdom. In him is all knowledge, infinite knowledge, infinite wisdom, infinite understanding. He possesses it all. So he is a supreme and sovereign alphabet. And next he says, I am the first and the last, the living one, alive forever. Revelation 1, 17 and 18. He's the first, not because he was created first. So the first year is not in terms of a, um, time. He's not in time. So he's the first it doesn't mean that he was created first but it means is in terms of position, he's above all, he's the first. And then he's the last because in him, all things hold together. In Christ, all things hold together. So that is the meaning of being the first and the last. Next, he says, I am he who searches the minds and hearts. You know, only God can do this. Only God knows the hearts of men. So Christ tells us that he is he who searches the hearts who searches the minds and hearts? Revelation 2, 23. Please, uh, I, I will encourage us to look up this scripture so that we'll know what Jesus said about himself, who he is. And every word he says about himself, he proved each and every one of them. And then uh, Revelation 3, 1, he says, I am coming quickly. So this Jesus we're talking about, did not just die, he did not just um, resurrect, he did not just ascend to heaven, he's coming again. So this is the Jesus we're talking about, the Jesus that is coming again. So sometimes those that don't really know Jesus, but are, uh, say they are Christians, they live as if they, they in fact, they, they are, their life show that they don't know him because if they know him, they will know he's coming again. So the way a believer lives will show whether he really knows the Jesus he's uh, professing. If he knows that this Jesus is coming again quickly, then <laughs> you know that you know the Jesus of the Bible. Say, I am the root and offspring of David, the bright morning star. Revelation 22, verse 16. So he is a offspring, and then at the same time, the root, the root and the offspring of David. So um, and lastly, he says, I am, John 8, verse 58. Before, you remember the phrase, before Abraham, I am. Maybe we should look at it. Um, Exodus, um, John 8, 58. Before Abraham, I'm, I am. So this, uh, grammatically speaking, this I am, it should be uh, before Abraham I was, but because Christ cannot be put in time. So it is not before 
Abraham, I was. He cannot be fit into time. So he is above time. So before Abraham, I am. That is the Christ Jesus that we are talking about. The one who existed from eternity and will exist to eternity. He is not bound by time. He is not controlled by time. He created time and he controls time. So before Abraham, I am. We have uh, concluded the, the I am of Christ. The things that Jesus said about himself, what he claimed to be, who he claimed to be as the scripture reveals. So this is the Jesus that we are talking about, the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus of the book, the Bible. Now we're moving forward to look at um, Jesus being 100% God. So because from these attributes, from these things, we see that Jesus is God. So how is he God? But he was man. So this takes us to the next um, level now that explains that Jesus is 100% God. He's as well 100% man. So how is he 100% God? As God, he existed from the beginning. And this we see in the book of Genesis as the Trinity, in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He existed from the beginning. Even when he became a man, he never ceased being God. So he has always been God and he remained God even while he was in the flesh and he will always remain God. Let's see uh, Colossians 2.9. Colossians 2 9. It says, For in him the whole fullness of deity, deity is God. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Like even though he was in flesh, in him the fullness, all that God is, is in Christ. Everything God is is in Christ. So he is God. That is the scriptures that tell us categorically that Jesus is God. <clears throat> Jesus Christ is God. Let's also see Hebrews 1, verse 1 to 3a. Hebrews 1, 1 to 3a. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophet. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. Through him, he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the power of his power, by the word of his power. Can someone read it from uh, another version for us? Uh, Hebrews 1 verse 3. Hebrews 1 3. If you find it first, please read. From a different version. I read from uh, ESV, I think. From NLT, you want. Okay. I read from In NLT, past. sorry. If you have ESV or something. Past, yeah. God spoke to fathers through the just, prophets. Sorry, just read verse times. three. Just okay. read verse three for us. Yeah. Uh, verse 3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After Thank he you. had provided purification for seeking the right hand of majesty. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We just wanted the first part that he is the exact representation yeah. of God. Jesus, okay. Jesus is the exact representation of God. Exact. So he there's God put in him the fullness of himself, the fullness, exact representation, because the aim was to reveal God to humanity to reveal who God is, because man could not find God. Man did not know God. So God in his love and infinite mercy brought Christ to us as a human, 
he 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 came as a human. So he is the exact representation of God. So this scripture also proves to us that Jesus is God. God's attributes is equal to Christ's attributes. We studied yesterday about God's attributes. We saw that God is sovereign. Jesus also is sovereign. Because in Matthew 28, verse 18, it says, <clears throat> all power in heaven and earth has been given to me. So if all power has been given to him, he is sovereign as well as God is sovereign. God is eternal, the same way Christ is. First John 1, 1 and 2. First John 1, 1 and 2. Let's read. He says, uh, we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. So they proclaimed Christ who existed from the beginning. So Christ is eternal. He existed from the beginning, just as God existed from the beginning. Genesis 1 said, in the beginning, God. So God had, had no beginning, no end. So in the, he began the beginning. So the same way Christ was there in the beginning. God is immutable. Jesus also is immutable. Hebrew 13, 8 says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Jesus is immutable. He is God. God is omniscient. We're not going through the scripture because we already covered this, um, the, the attributes of God yesterday. So, but we're just trying to prove that Jesus is God because he also has the attributes of God. So God being omniscient, Jesus also is omniscient. You see in Colossians 2, 2b to 3, say the knowledge, he's the knowledge of God's mystery. He's omniscient. He knows everything. You know, uh, we may not be able to go through all the scriptures, but we know. Okay, let's see um, Colossians 2, 2 and 3. Colossians 2, 2 and 3. I will read it. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. They see God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. Three, in him lies hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You know, we have discussed about Christ being the divine the supreme sovereign alphabet. In him is all knowledge. He's all knowing. He knows everything. So he's perfect and sinless. Second Corinthians 5, 21. He is perfect. He is sinless. We may not read all. We just pick some to read. Christ is holy. Acts 14 to 15. He's the holy lamb. The only one worthy to pay the price, the only one worthy to open the scroll because there was none other righteous. He is the truth, John 14, verse six. We have read that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He's omnipotent. He said, all power has been given to him. And how did he demonstrate this power? Everything he claimed here, he also demonstrated. He's omnip uh, omnipotent, meaning that he has all power. We have read that scriptures earlier <clears throat> that all power in heaven and on earth and beneath the earth have been given to him. Or he demonstrated that power, his power over nature when he calmed the sea. He had power over nature. He has power over sicknesses. Uh, that we see in uh, Matthew 8, 23 to 27, how Jesus calmed the sea when he spoke, the storm heard him and obeyed. So that was a demonstration of his power over nature. He has power over sicknesses. In many places he healed. He healed all the sick that were brought to him. Luke 440, for example. He also cast out demons. He had power over demons. So Luke 4, 33 to 36, and other places where he casted out, where he cast out demons. He raised the dead, showing that he has power over death. So Lazarus was an example. 
John 11, 43 to 44, he raised the dead. And finally, he also demonstrated his power over sin. So he showed that he has power over sin. None else had the power to forgive sin except God. Only God had power to forgive sin. But Jesus demonstrated his power, his omnipotence over sin. Mark 2, verse 10. He has power to forgive sins. And then... Um, Let's also see um, John 1, verse 1 and 14. John 1, verse 1 and 14. Says, um, you remember, we're just we we're trying to pick all the scriptures that prove to us that Jesus is God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So Jesus being the word of God, he is he was from the beginning. So, and verse 14 says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. We have seen his glory. So he became flesh. This expressly explains that Jesus is God, even though he became flesh. He was the word that was there from the beginning. Let's also see a Titus um, chapter 2, verse 13. Titus 2, 13. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our great God. This is referring to Jesus, our great God and Savior. So the scripture, there is no contradiction and there is no blurredness about it. Everything is, is clearly stated. The, the, the deity of Jesus Christ is clearly stated all over the scriptures. So anyone who knows Christ, who, knows, who believes in the scripture, will not doubt that Jesus Christ is God. He himself claimed to be God. Let's see. Yeah, John 10, 31 and 33. John 10, 31 and 33. The Jews picked up stones again, again to stone him. 32. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? Verse 33, the Jews answered him, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. So they understood Christ. They understood there was no contradiction about what Christ claimed to be. The Jews understood him, that he claimed to be God. He claimed to be the son of God. To them, being a son of God means that you're equal to God. So in their context, in their language, that is what it means. And Jesus claimed to be the son of God. So and this, because they understood it, and they didn't know God. So for they, they saw Jesus as a just ordinary a, a man. So how can a man claim to be God? So to them, it was blasphemy because they did not know the scriptures. They did not believe the scriptures. If they knew, they would know that Jesus is God. So you, you make yourself God. They accused him. So clearly here it has, we have seen that Jesus is God. There is no, he, he, he proclaimed it by himself. He's, he, he declared it in many other places. So he is God. There is no contradiction about that. And again, uh, we move on to Jesus being 100% man. Jesus is man, 100% man, just like every human being. And then um, this was made possible being God. How did he become a man? He became a man through incarnation. Let's uh, look at them. Um, is it Philippians? Okay, we have read the uh, Colossians 2 9. We can look at it again. Colossians 2 9. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Bodily. He was born 
as flesh. He came down as flesh. He made himself, he took on humanity, even though he remains God. He did not stop or he did not cease being God, but through incarnation, he humbled himself. He forsook, he left his glory and he le left out some of his attributes and he came to become a man through incarnation so that we can be saved. Philippians 2, 6 and 7. If you're there, read for us, please. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> so far, does anyone have any question or comments? No? Any question from anyone? No, no quite, nobody's signifying here. OK. Thank you. So we continue then. So um, I was in uh, Philippians. Um, OK, the incarnation, Philippians 2, 6 and 7. So you say, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Somebody can read again for us um, from a different version. Let's get, because this is an exp express declaration of, or explanation of this, how Jesus came to be a man. What version do you want? NLT. Yeah, read NLT, let's see. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. To eight, eh? Yeah. Eight. No, no, seven, seven, seven is okay, seven, seven is okay, yeah. He gave up, he gave up, he did not like, this explains um, the, the, I am, I'm humble and uh, I'm gentle and humble in heart. This explains it. So it is out of, it was out of his humility, his gentleness, he gave up, willingly he gave up his position and took the form of man. There was a, uh, I like uh, the analogy that uh, Brakal made some time ago about this, he said, uh, look uh, at as a human, okay, just look at worms. Worms, you know how worms are bred, they, they are in dirt, they're in uh, human waste, and they are just there, you know, uh, doing their own thing. And imagine that they are going towards a cliff. And in hell, where all of them will this is about an analogy. I was talking about an analogy that the brother gave the other time. He said, like, imagine a, you know, worms. We are humans. You're, we're clean and everything. Just imagine you see worms. You know, we know how they breed. They are in dirt, in fields, in a human a waste. They are just there, you know, doing their own thing, and they are heading towards a cliff that will end in, a, let's say, lake of fire that they will all be destroyed. And you're watching them, and because you love them, you don't want them to be destroyed, and you decide to become a worm, and you get into that field. You get into that human waste and that they are wasting in just to be able to save them. That this was what Christ did by taking up, humbling himself, leaving out his glory, leaving his uh, divine attributes, some of his divine attributes to take on humanity. You know, even though he never ceased being God, he took on the humble state of man, not just of a man, but a slave, a bond servant, a slave, that even his own did not record, they killed him. So this was what Jesus did for us. He added humanity to his deity, to his divinity. 
Uh, let's see Matthew 17, 1 to 8. Matthew 17, verses 1 to 8. This is about the transfiguration here, just to bring about, um, to show us how a little, little revelation of his glory was shown to his, uh, to some of his disciples. But it, I think it's good that we read it. Matthew 17, 1 to 8. Please, if you're there, read for us. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up, up a high mountain to be alone. Mm -hmm. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I will make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Five, but when, but even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved, my dearly beloved, my dearly loved son, who brings me great joy. Listen to him. Six, the disciples were terrified and fell down, fell face down on the ground. To six? Uh, yeah, to eight, to eight. Seven, then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. Eight, and when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone and they saw only Jesus. So thank you, thank you, Sister Francisca. So this is a, 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 small, a revelation of the glory, the glory that Jesus Christ had. They saw it, they felt that they could not stand it. It was so, he's so glorious, but he, he left this glory. He willingly, willingly left it and gave himself, humbled himself to take on humanity, even though he was God. In this place that we read there, other things that could be taken out from, from uh, this, about, you know, some people claiming that Jesus entered their room. Rapport has talked about this. So, and, you know, Jesus has ascended to heaven. He's no longer here in the flesh. He's, he's, he's in heaven. So he doesn't, he, the Holy Spirit is the one here. So when people claim that they drink tea with Jesus, he came and to their rooms and they spoke and they talked. You know, we shouldn't believe such things. You know, Jesus is glory, God's glory. He's highly glory. Uh, he's, he's the fullness of God in the flesh. So when he was in the flesh, they didn't know him. They didn't recognize him. But here there was a revelation of the glory of, of, uh, of Jesus. And his disciples could not, you know, even look at him. You know, they were terrified. They were afraid. They fell down. So this is the Jesus that we are talking about. He's so glorious, but he took on humanity so that we can be saved. He left, willingly, he left his glory. John 17, verse 5. John 17, 5. Let's see some of the, you know, how he emptied himself. Maybe, uh, yeah, let's see how he emptied himself. John 17, verse 5. Did I read? Yes, please. Thank you. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. Thank you. So this was his glory. Not that he didn't have it. He had it even before the world began. He had this glory with God because he is God. So, but because he decided he came to be offered himself voluntarily. So he set aside this glory. He's emptied himself of this glory and he came as human. You know, he, he uh, another point there is that he set aside his independent authority because he is God. He had the, the same authority that God has, God the Father has. Jesus also has that authority. For he voluntarily, 
you know, set it aside. Let's see this in Philippians also, Philippians 2, 7. We have read it before. He said, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. So he uh, willingly emptied himself of this authority. And, and this answers the question of um, uh, John, uh, John 14, 28, where Jesus said that the father is greater than I. <clears throat> and some people will say, we will hold on that scripture, you know, to claim that Jesus was not God because he said the father is greater than I. So this explains it that he humbly, I mean, he, he voluntarily set aside his, his, uh, the independent exercise of that authority, of that power, divine power that he has, because he is also God. This uh, we have seen in Philippians 2, 7. Again, he set aside the open display of his divine attributes. So he is, we have gone through the, his divine attributes. He has all, all power, he has all uh, authority, he has his omnipotent, his omniscient, but he left them out and he took the form of a man, the form of a servant. You know, he became human. He voluntarily set aside that. We can also see that in Matthew 24, 36. Matthew 24, 36. Thirty-six. It says, "However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son Himself. Only the Father knows. He chose. He chose that position. It is it's not that uh, because he's a man that was all he didn't know. He was God at that time, and he is still God." But this, is a, this was a voluntary act. He chose to set aside his, the display, some display of his divine attributes. He set it aside. Uh, also, he also set aside his eternal riches. We see 2 Corinthians 8, 9. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Let's also read that. Second Corinthians 8 verse 9, it says, you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. <clears throat> this is something that he also did willingly, something he also emptied himself of, his divine riches. <clears throat> Excuse me. His divine riches, he, uh, he set it aside for the mission. Also, he set aside his face-to-face -face relationship with the Father. Matthew 27, 46. Matthew 27, 46. If you're there before me, please read this thing. 46, he says, um, at about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabatani which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? So this was a very grievous moment for him. But this was what he chose. He humbly set aside this uh, relationship for this time. So it was a very great sacrifice for him. He had to be man in order to die in man's place. So all this he did because he could not, you know, there, there is, it, it was not um, possible to save man without being a man. It, because it took a man to for Adam, so it, it, it had to take a man to save man. So that was why he became man in order to save man. Matthew 20, 28, we can read that. He had to be God to be the perfect sacrifice. He had to be God in order to be the sac perfect sacrifice. There, is, there was no one, no one was worthy except him. So it's only he that is worthy and only he was uh, able to do it. And he came and he did it for us. Though he was sinless, though he was uh, without sin, he took our sins upon himself. 
So we can also read them um, Romans 3, 23, and 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Romans 3.23. We're coming to the end. If you're there, you can leave for us, please. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yes, we all have sinned and have fallen short, and it's only requires a perfect sinless one. So if all have sinned, that means no one was worthy. No one could be the sac perfect sacrifice except God himself. So that was why Christ came to be man. And it's also very clear that he was fully 100% man because he felt everything that man felt. He was hungry like we feel hungry. So we, it's not because he was deity, he was God, therefore he was superhuman. No, like some people claim that they are superhuman because they are pastors, they, they never get sick, they never get uh, pain, they are like up there. So if Christ himself being a man felt hungry, felt tired, felt he slept, you know, how can a man like you and I claim that he never, they never get tired, they are superhuman. So that rules out their claims. So Jesus was 100% human in that he felt the same way we felt. Everything we passed through, he also passed through them. He wept when Lazarus died. He, be, he, he saw Mary and Martha the way they were weeping because he was 100% human. He had compassion, he had feeling, he, he wept in the scriptures. So he also felt, he also slept in the boats when the storm was raging. He went on the beneath and he was fast asleep because he was tired. And also when they were traveling, he felt he was tired and he you know, also stopped to rest. So there is no doubt or no argument about the fact that Jesus also was... Um, felt everything we felt that he was a man like us, 100% man like us. So um, the next time um, we have seen Jesus being 100% God, he's also 100% man. So Jesus Christ is our savior. Jesus Christ who is our savior. So uh, um, now we, we know Jesus as the savior. So, but we have to, it's important for us to know that he's the savior of the world is different from he being my savior. So it has to be a personified thing because he came for, uh, he came for the world to save the world. But he has you in mind. He has me individuals in mind. So when we know Christ, we have to know him as not just the savior of the world, but as my savior. He is my savior. So we have seen this Christ, this Christ that died, he's no longer in the grave to be clear, that died on the cross and was buried, he resurrected, he was, ex he was he's exalted and he will come again in glory. So this is the Jesus that the Bible teaches about. He's not the Jesus of the fanfare, he's not the Jesus of a, of a means to get what we want. This is the Jesus of the Bible. And he is also the coming king. He is coming. He's not just there. He is coming back. We see in Daniel uh, 7 verse 4. And we we'll take these few last scriptures. I'm rounding up now. Daniel 7 verse 4. Please read for us if you're there. If you're there, read for us, please. Daniel 7, verse Daniel 7, 14. 4 or 14? 14, 14, 14. 14, 14. He, was, he, 14. he was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world. 
so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. Destroyed. Thank you. So, I was reading, um, I was reading at one, um, where one eleven. It says, "The uh, men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven." in the same way you saw him go so he's coming back he's coming to reign he's coming to rule matthew 25 31 and 32. matthew 25 31 and 32 says but when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him then he will sit upon his glorious all the nations died in his presence, and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. This is Jesus. He's coming and he will rule. Second Thessalonians 1 7 to 10. Second Thessalonians 1 7 to 10. If you're there before me, please read. And God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. He will come with his mighty angels. Up to 10, please. Up to 10. In flaming fire, sorry, seven. Uh, and God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when he when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven, he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. Nine, they will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. 10, when he comes on that day, he will receive glory from his holy people, praise from all who believe. And this includes you, for you believed what we told you about him. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. This, we, <laughs> you know, we have got, we have brought out, we've been able to bring out many scriptures that have explained who Jesus is. And this is a promise to us that he's coming back. He's coming in his glory. <clears throat> he's coming in his power. And when he comes on that day, he will receive glory from his people, from his holy people. So with glory to God, praise from all who believe. So this is who Jesus is. And we're grateful that he has given us this, this great blessing to know him, this great blessing to 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 believe in whom he has said that he is, in the revelation of him, you know, we are blessed to be his people. And he said he will uh, praise from all who believe. And this includes you, this includes me, is a thing of joy for us, for we believe what he told, what they told us, what the scripture says, the writings of the apostle, we believe. He said, for you believed what we told you, about him. So brethren, we are indeed blessed because we know this Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, the one who has revealed God to us, the, the King, our Savior, who is coming back to rule. So this brings us back to the, to the initial question we asked in, in, in a Matthew 27, 22. You know, Pilate had the Messiah standing there before him standing in front of him, the Messiah that many in the Old Testament, many looked forward to, many wanted to see him. When Anna saw him at the temple as a baby, he said, oh, now my eyes have seen, you know, the Messiah, now I can die. 
you know, and this Messiah was standing before Pilate. Pilate did not know him. And Pilate asked, then what should I do with this Jesus who is called the Messiah? Many saw him in his time, but they didn't know him. And they asked, what should I do? And they concluded they should kill him. But this is the Messiah that has come to save, to save us. And this, the, the, this hour we have gone through the scriptures and we know this Jesus. What should I do with this Jesus? What should you do with this Jesus? Even those that will listen to this message in time, what will you do with this Jesus that has been revealed to us? What will you do with him, this Messiah? So uh, it's, I don't know. Let's look at the second Peter three fourteen. Second Peter three fourteen. And so dear friends, and so dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found, living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. What should we do with him? We have accepted him. We believe, we believe in him. And we are glad that now we have him who is our hope, the hope of eternal life. We are glad that we have eternal life through Christ now. So we are encouraged to be diligent, diligent as we wait for him. And this will also lead us to our knees in worship as, as we see in Revelation 5. Verses, let's read it, Revelation 5, 11 to 14. Then I looked again and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and the elders. And they sang in a mighty chorus, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and glory and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Then, and then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, they sang blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And the four living beings said, amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped the lamb. Praise God. That is the end of the class. Yeah. Any question at this point? Any contribution? Any confusion? Do we find it difficult to reconcile the fact that the same Jesus that was hungry, that was tired, and that wept at the tomb of Lazarus, that shows the attribute of man, is also God. Are we, how, are we satisfied with that, with that teaching? Is it clear that Jesus that shows, that had all the attribute of man at the same time is God? Is that clear? to us, do we accept that as being true? Is that, is that clear and straightforward? Sister, Sister Francisca, you want to say something? Uh, the human mind cannot comprehend it. Me, my tiny brain cannot fit it together, but that is what the Bible says and it's, it's true. So I have to believe it. John 1 says, John 1 14, I think it's that Hamas I've read it today. Um, is it John 14 or John 1 4? The word gave life to everything that was created. Well, let's start from John 1 1. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God, and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created every, everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. So at creation, the word was with God. The word was involved in creation. If you flip, go back just downwards, chapter this chapter one. 
So the word became human. So the word that was with God at the beginning at creation became human and made his home among us. It was full of unveiling love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father and only Son. So we also saw in Genesis 1, God created the moon and earth. In other words, so at creation, there was the word who has always been with God. And that world who has always been with God became man. And that's true, Sister Han, that only God can redeem us from himself, from himself. So the story of Christ is redemption. God came to redeem us. That's the story of Christ. And this is a truth. This is the basis of Christian faith. And even, you know, we just finished studying First John, right? Uh, and John gave us one of the ways to know one of the ways to know who is speaking by the spirit of Antichrist, First John chapter 4. That person will never give the truth about Christ. So, um, Crefo Dollar, he said, Jesus is not God because he was sleeping. Copeland, he said, Jesus is not God because he was tired. Again, he also has a screwed view of Jesus. Okay, let's come to Nigeria. Our pastors put themselves in place of Jesus. There's somebody here who knows this one. We go to the same church before. The man will lie down on the altar and he will say, he has died now. Now everybody should pray that we are, we should, they should convert, convert his grace citing what Jesus said, I think it's in John 14, that when the seed dies, it bears more fruit. So he will sleep on the altar, lie down on the altar, or on the podium, and people will be praying to him to receive his grace. This is a whole screwed view of Christ. Therefore, all these guys do are not working for God. Because John told us, whoever does not have the truth about Christ is operating by the spirit of Antichrist. So today's class is dua. Dua in the sense that it comforts our heart who this Jesus is. And it also helps us to be able to design. Brothers and sisters, the person who is operating by the spirit of Antichrist will not pretend to speak the truth. They cannot speak the truth. They can't. They are not equipped to say it. It's just like saying Satan one day will say the truth. He can't. By nature, he can't. Satan can't speak the truth. So those who are working, who are not working for God, will not speak the truth. Mr. Hans also said that. Jesus said himself, if I do not leave, the comforter will not come. So they are not, there's, there's no duaro. Christ has gone. So the man that drank, drank tea with Christ, which only Christ? Christ is not here. Paul said, we don't know him again after the flesh. It's not possible. So who drank tea with him? Either he had dementia or he drank tea with demons, but not the Christ of the Bible. The Christ of the Bible is a real historical figure who came and died sacrificially. And this man, at the same time, is God. Like Sister Francisca said, we can't reconcile to, but that is the truth of Christian faith, and that is the Jesus in whom we are faith. Thank you, Sister, Sister Han, for today's class. Uh, is there any question, anything you want us to clarify before we call it a day? Valentine, you're talking, well, you're on mute. Yes. Um, no, I just want to say it's a good lesson. And uh, just similar to what we studied yesterday. And he's just telling us that Jesus is the same as uh, the Father. On the other hand, Brother Paul, I just like the way you, you track down some of these people whom, in quotes, we regard as big men of God. Uh, they are fallacies. Unfortunately, uh, the simple believer out there just believe in these people. They believe in these people. And uh, wouldn't me, 
I think uh, it is, when when I finished, go through this FKN beta. And uh, let me just end there for now. Thank you very much. Yeah, you remember yesterday, attributes and characters of God. God is sovereign. God is eternal. God is unchanging. He's all-knowing. He's perfect or sinless. God is holy. And God is God of truth. The same attributes with Jesus. The same. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus is sovereign. John, first John 1, 1 and 2, Jesus, Jesus is eternal. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus is unchanging. Colossians 2, 2 to 3 is all-knowing. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 is perfect. Act 3, 14 to 5, 15 is holy. John 14, 6 is truth. So if by the time you go to Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit class, you see the same attribute of God, attribute of Christ, attribute of the spirits, they are all the same. So if they have the same attributes, that means that they have the same substance. And this truth is one of the most important thing we have to know in Christian faith because people today will say, if Jesus did it, I can do it. <laughs> we are not in Jesus' class. We are not. And that's why Jesus gave us apostles, real human beings that we can follow. So Paul will say, follow me. As I follow Christ, real human being, 100% human. Today, many people have put themselves in place of Christ. So when you say what, the word antichrist, English did not help us to understand that word properly. Because when you say antichrist, in English, anti means against. Antibacteria, antifungi, antiparasite, you know, antithetic. But in Greek, anti means in place or instead. Of course, the person who is acting in place of instead of Christ, we work against Christ. And in application, the person who is an antichrist is working against Christ, I know. But in Greek rendition, it means in place or instead. So people who are praying in the name of their GU, that's blatant heresy. That's blasphemy. Oh God of my father, that is blasphemy. It's blatant heresy. It's not applied or it's not possible for you to pray in the name of my God. Really? Yeah. <laughs> that, is, that is bad. When Paul spoke about prayer, Ephesians 1 3, blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When Peter spoke about prayer, 2 Peter 1 2 1 3, blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because in the New Testament, there's no mediation between God and man. The same thing the reformers fought for 500 years ago. The Catholic brought into Christianity papacy. They brought papacy. They brought mediums, Mary, saints. It's the same thing that has come back again. We let our Orthodox Church thinking, oh, we'll find freedom. It's the same devil. That has also brought this thing back. What do we call our fathers, pastors today? Either we call them daddy or papa. It's the same thing, papa. See. The word papa or pope means holy father or father. And Jesus said, call nobody father. Right? We have only one heavenly father. The same things the reformers fought for has come back again. So either call your pastor daddy, which is pope, or papa, which is pope. Then, what did the Catholic brought? They brought medium between man and God. So, God is far up there. You can't reach him. You need a medium. Either you go through the saint, or you go through Mary, or you go through Pope, or you go through the bishop, or you go through the cardinal, or you go through the priest. It has come back again today. So, people will conveniently say, they will castigate Catholic for praying through Mary, but they will pray, oh God, my father. He is the same spirit, the same deceptive spirit. Christ is God and at the same time man. is the root mm -hmm. and the offspring of David. Is the root and the offspring of David. How do you just oppose those, those two? Before David exists, after David exists. We are comforted by this truth. And let's go in this, in this confidence, knowing whom we have believed. It's time for us to know what we believe and why we believe what we believe, so that we'll be able to communicate this truth moving on. This is the end of today's class. And um, in the next class, next week, Saturday, we'll be studying the work 
of Christ, not the works, not plural. We'll be studying the work of Christ, not the works of Christ. Because Christ, having understood the fact that God revealed himself in Christ to us, now why did Christ come? He didn't come for many things. He came for one thing. One thing. In him, Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption and forgiveness of sin sin. by his blood. That's why you cannot pray, I cover you with the blood of Jesus. It's a superstitious belief. It's just empty, empty statement. It's an empty statement. Christ came for one thing. It's called the work of Christ, not the works. So Christ did not come to get you rich. He did not come to make you have a husband. He did not come to give you a car. He did not come to give you prosperity. He did not come to make you travel out. He came for one thing, so that man can rightly worship God again. So next week, Saturday, we'll be learning the work of Christ. And on Sunday, we'll be learning salvation. Please come prepared, come on time. And I can see some people are joining us fresh. Uh, it's a long class. I will, we will recommend that you cover up the areas you have missed so that you can understand where we are moving forward. Any question, any contribution before we stop the recording? None? So recording has stopped.